Hey, good evening, everyone. I'm Jim Ambusky of the Washington Library Center for Digital History. I am fortunate to serve as the host of the podcast Conversations at the Washington Library there, which you can find all of your favorite episodes at our new website, georgewashingtonpodcast.com. Now, we have got a great show planned for you this evening. We're talking with a fine historian and one of my favorite people in Dr. Tamika Nunley. We'll have a couple of programming notes at the end of uh, the show this evening, uh, but uh, so stay tuned for that. But let's get started with tonight's main event so we can get right to it. In 1802, a 23-year-old enslaved woman named Sarah Ann Owens fled the slaveholder William Foote, seeking refuge in Washington, D.C. She was among the thousands of enslaved women who labored in the nation's capital, helping to build temples dedicated to liberty while being denied their own. Tonight, we have the opportunity to learn more about black women like Owens and many others who sought freedom for themselves and imagined a life outside of bondage. It's my pleasure, therefore, to welcome to the program Dr. Tamika Nunley. Dr. Nunley is currently an associate professor of history and comparative American studies at Oberlin College, but breaking news folks, this summer she'll join the faculty at Cornell University. She is the author of the new book, At the Threshold of Liberty, Women, Slavery, and Shifting Identities in Washington, D.C., published just this last week by the University of North Carolina Press. Dr. Nunley, thanks for joining us this evening. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I'm very uh, pleased to have you, and I'm uh, just curious to know how things are. I assume you're in uh, open uh, uh, Northeast Ohio right now and how things are up there. Yes, I'm in Cleveland right now. So, um, you know, we are pretty much remote. Um, and so I've been publicizing the book remotely as much as possible. So thank you for this opportunity. Well, it's our pleasure. And I like the big poster you've got there. Of the yes, <laughs> courtesy of UNC Press. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just want to, uh, we'll get started here in a minute, uh, Dr. Nunley Tanika, if I may, but I just want to remind mm -hmm. the folks at home that you'll have a chance to ask Dr. Nunley questions in the second half of today's program. To do that, simply type in your question in the comment section, wherever you're watching, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, uh, Twitter Periscope. We'll, we'll be happy to take your questions in the second half uh, of tonight's program, and we're, we're excited to do it. And, um, you know, if you're like me and you spend way too much money on books, uh, we've got a deal for you this evening because you can pick up a copy of Dr. Nunley's book uh, directly from the University of North Carolina Press for 40% off. Uh, and you can do that via the link that we're dropping in the comment section right now. So give that a look. Uh, please do pick up a coffee if you're so inclined. Uh, I think that we would all really appreciate it. So, Tamika. Yes. Let's get started. Uh, right. And actually, let's start with the cover, because uh, I thought yes. we might uh, begin to talk about your book by talking about the woman who was on its cover. Mm -hmm. And would you tell us a little bit about who she was and, uh, and something about her life? Absolutely. So Elizabeth Keckley um, is the person who graces the cover, and she was born enslaved um, and eventually learned um, how to sew and how to sew very expensive uh, dresses for some of the most elite women in the nation. And as a result, she was able to generate enough income to purchase her freedom and the freedom of her son. And then she moved to Washington, D.C., where she became a prominent activist and also a very well-known and respected businesswoman. And so when the editors really suggested that she grace the cover of the book, this was really a fine choice, um, mm -hmm. mainly because she really embodies this idea of shifting identities or self-making, as I put it in the book. And um, she has lived in bondage. She has lived as an entrepreneur. She has lived as a, um, a prominent socialite and, and social activist. Um, she has all of these different kinds of lives that she has lived through and in, in some way, she is sort of the perfect embodiment of this idea of self-making. So I want to get into this, this idea of self-making and shifting identities over the course of this evening. Uh, but first, I, I was wondering what, what you set out to accomplish by studying enslaved women in Washington, D.C. When you were researching, when you were rooting around for a project, you're know, reading through the scholarly literature, reading what has been written about Washington before, what did you see was missing from that story? Well, at first I started off to answer a pretty common question that we see in the literature around Civil War history. Um, as a graduate student, 
uh, we are oftentimes concerned about this question in Civil War studies of who freed the slaves. Mm -hmm. And um, there can be multiple answers, whether it be the government or the soldiers or the slaves themselves. And so um, much of my work really began in the Civil War era, thinking about the kinds of actions that Black women took in order to initiate their own process of freedom. And what I found is that this process was happening much earlier than uh, 1865, right? And during the Civil War that we could see evidence of Black women making really important claims to liberty um, from the founding of the nation's capital. And so I set out to really examine this idea of liberty um, and not just um, sort of how we typically look at liberty, particularly when we're thinking about the founding generation and the promise of the American Revolution being this very egalitarian enterprise. Um, many of us are familiar with that narrative and many of us are familiar with the ways that those um, political thinkers of the revolutionary generation sort of really deployed this discourse of liberty. But what we're less familiar with is how African-Americans and black women in particular thought about um, that term. Um, particularly those who were enslaved, right? And so I begin with thinking about how we might begin to understand how Black women were conceptualizing liberty at various points in their lives and also in different legal contexts. And so this now becomes a book that um, sort of branches beyond the Civil War and really starts in the early periods of the, the nation's founding. And what we see is that Black women occupy different kinds of statuses uh, legal contexts um, that have been imposed upon them. Um, but what became more interesting to me is the ways in which they imagine their lives beyond those legal contexts. Um, and that changes um, over time and it changes depending on the type, the woman that we are discussing. So when you were in the archives then, it was in you were digging through legal records and you first started to notice how uh, enslaved women and free black women were imagining the different lives for themselves and trying to figure out how to navigate the space, and we'll come to that that idea of navigation in just a minute. But mm -hmm. it sounds like that was sort of the moment where you were seeing this this uh, these ideas in action. Absolutely. Um, you know, I think it's easy for us to think about Black women as being marginal to larger events like the Civil War, right, or the American Revolution. But what we find when we're looking in the record is that they're very much a part of the landscape and very much um, a part of that moment. And so I started looking at fugitive slave ads. I started looking at bills of sale. I looked at diaries and memoirs of prominent um, white Washingtonians and saw hidden in plain sight these black women who were a part of their lives. And what's interesting is, um, you know, I start the book off with a slave advertisement. And what became intriguing to me is um, this woman who escapes um, her owner's house, um, he puts out an ad and he says that she's going around DC naming herself um, Suki when we call her Suri. Um, and she's going to hire herself out as a free woman. And there were uh, quite a few ads that I came across that um, conveyed something similar. And what I noticed there was that there was a complete reimagining of oneself um, that um, did not align with what the the slaveholder wanted, but aligned more so with what these women were imagining for themselves. And um, and that's where the idea of self-making came from, is sort of trying to listen and to, to, to look for Black women in sources that have been typically used and also sources that have not um, been used as much. And so it has required me to sort of be more flexible and think about um, a, a lot of different kinds of source spaces. Well, as you were digging through these source spaces, obviously, as, as the title of your book suggests, and as you just mentioned, it's about Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. And the story you're telling, as you as you noted earlier, you know, didn't begin in 1865. It begins much earlier uh, mm -hmm. in the early republic. And why Washington, D.C.? Why that particular city as opposed to another southern city like Charleston or Savannah, uh, Norfolk, uh, you know, Richmond, what have you? What was it about? you know, the district that mm -hmm. appealed to you, but also you, you realized uh, was an opportunity to tell a much more important story than had been told before. Absolutely. I think that sort of the broader um, idea, right, is thinking about liberty and mm -hmm about the ways that liberty is a familiar concept to us when we're thinking about the early republic. 
Um, but the nation's capital, right, is a place in which these um, revolutionary era leaders begin to sort of plot their designs and their desires for um, the nation's capital to be this kind of beacon and, and symbol of all that is great about the Republic. And so these Black women actually test the boundaries or the limits of liberty in really important ways and actually sort of give the district um, its own meaning, right, because of what they're doing in the capital. Um, um, but then the capital is also very interesting geographically, right? It's yeah. um, sort of in the middle um, on the mid-Atlantic seaboard, right? It's also, right, um, nestled between um, two of the oldest slaveholding states in the nation, um, Maryland and Virginia, and it is um, carved out of those states. And in some ways, in more ways than one, right? So not just geographically, but also um, DC ends up adopting a lot of the kinds of slave codes and black codes that are um, implemented in those states as well into that city. And so it becomes Becomes a place where slaveholders um, want to feel like their slaves, their interest in the in owning slaves is protected, um, mm -hmm. particularly um, political leaders from the South when they are coming to the district to conduct the business of the government, right? They want to know that this is a place in which they can feel like their property interests are protected. But at the same time, um, there are anti-slavery forces that are targeting the district as an opportunity to really dismantle the federal commitment um, to, to slavery. And so there are these sort of sectional political forces kind of descending upon the district in important ways. But what's more interesting to me in my book is how these women actually target the capital to do what they want to do with the capital, right? Whether it's um, to um, sort of uh, uh, and pursue legal configurations of freedom, whether it is to establish their own churches or to go to school um, or to connect with other kin. Um, so there are all sorts of ways in which the district becomes important, not just to the founding generation, but to these to, to these black women who have been there for decades. And in this space, then, what are black women and other enslaved people doing? What does slavery look like in Washington? Mm -hmm. I you know, we're often accustomed to thinking about plantation slavery right at Mount mm -hmm. Vernon or somewhere in the deep south or you know down the road here at Monticello but here we're talking about urban slavery and what is mm -hmm. that like? what kind of experiences and what kind of opportunities do individuals like Elizabeth Keckley and others have in that space mm -hmm. you know it's interesting because we typically associate the Upper South with sort of um, declining um, slavery, right? And so um, there is a, a huge push, right, to bring slaves into the Deep South. Um, there is a domestic slave trade that is taking off after 1808. Um, and DC actually becomes a hub um, for slave traders who are um, taking enslaved people from the Upper South and, um, and moving them to the Deep South. Um, but what's also interesting about this phenomenon is that many of these enslaved people are also being hired out in cities like DC and Richmond and um, Baltimore as well. And hiring out is when you have surplus slaves that you no longer are using on your estate or your plantation, and you are renting them out um, to people who need access um, to this labor, right? And so these women become hires in DC and become a very important source of domestic labor uh, for many of those um, households that end up living in DC. And oftentimes this is um, really also thinking about um, white politicians mm -hmm. and their own self-making at this moment, right? In some ways, you know, the capital is this very mysterious village that isn't quite developed, right? Buildings aren't quite complete, right? And there are commissioners trying to, you know, make it appealing to live in DC. And so um, having these servants, having this life, uh, this sort of genteel existence uh, domestically is very much based upon the labor of black women who are hired out in the system. And so my book shows the ways in which these women are hired out intra-regionally, right, um, within the Chesapeake and in D.C. Um, and so oftentimes our focus is right uh, is on all of the enslaved people that come from the Upper South to the Deep South. Um, but what I show is sort of the intra-regional um, uh, exchange in enslaved women's labor.
Well, wh one of the things I found that was absolutely fascinating about your book, and I, I had read a little bit about this, but nothing of substance until you know your book here, is the extent to which in this space, as you say, you know, Washington DC is not the place we think it is today where traffic is a nightmare. But in that period, right, it's, um, it's, you know, it's, it's more rural, it's in development. And as you say, enslaved women are, are being brought in from the different parts of the region to help, you know, white slave owners perform, you know, a sense of mastery. But the extent to which um, enslaved women were used as collateral in economic mm -hmm. exchange and in even mortgaged in a lot of ways. And I was wondering if you talk a little bit about that because that, as I said, I had read a little bit about that, but I was surprised the extent to which that was uh, a custom of financial mm -hmm. uh, and racial capitalism, I think, as you call it in, in your book. Mm -hmm. And that term comes from um, Cedric Robinson um, and, and this idea of racial capitalism really sort of um, shaping um, American labor economies at a, at a very early point in history and then us sort of thinking about the afterlives of slavery and how after legal emancipation, we're still grappling with the impact of racial capitalism and the ways in which these um, women's lives are circumscribed. Um, but to your point about um, how slavery as a business works in DC, it's actually a very vibrant business. And so I take the records where there are bills of sale and oftentimes they don't tell us a full story. They tell us a name, they tell us an age, right? And how much they were um, exchanged for, how, how much they were valued at. Um, but what it shows us is that actually slavery was very important um, to the economic vitality of the capital. And so um, oftentimes, um, if we're not attentive to sort of how these cities um, sort of emerge, um, we might miss the fact um, that many of these people were reliant upon slavery. And I think that um, when political thinkers were considering where to put the capital, um, that there was the, an assumption that carving the capital out of these um, states would lend itself right to um, allowing slavery um, to have a place in that uh, that capital. Um, and even if it was just for a specific period of time, it was going to help the capital sort of become a more economically viable um, uh, city. And so it does, it does just that. And so these women are trying to navigate this. Um, they are being displaced, right? They are going from home to home, often time mm -hmm. to resolve the debts right, of um, um, a white resident um, in DC. Um, if someone passes away, um, oftentimes, right, the estates are settled um, as a result of their sale. And so um, the city actually, because there are not sort of highly developed markets in the first decade of the nation's capital, it's really um, in the taverns, right? Uh, the historic taverns and homes and legal offices, um, that become sites of slave sales. Um, and so we typically don't associate those kind of historic landmarks with, with the slave trade, but actually um, because space was at a premium, um, they were using any kind of space they could in order to enact these transactions. And so slavery becomes really important for thinking about how white Washingtonians can engage in their own acts of self-making. And we see this with prominent women like Margaret Bayard Smith, who's the wife right, of a prominent um, uh, political voice in DC. And um, this is someone's, uh, you know, this is someone who people talk about a lot, actually, because yeah. she's a you know prolific writer. She, um, you know, keeps record of her life in DC. Um, but she also is talking about employing the labor of uh, of a, a little girl, a five-year-old enslaved girl, right, um, who she hopes to find some comfort and happiness in. And, um, and so how does that then begin to change or shape our understanding of what life in the capital is and, and how her aspirations are very much tethered to the life of this little girl? Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about the lives of, of these uh, folks like these little girls and others. As you already suggested there's a great deal of mobility. People are coming into the district and out of it. Uh, mm -hmm. People are residents there. Enslaved people are residents there. And one of the, the important parts of your book is this idea of navigation. And you've mentioned that word already. And I wonder if you can kind of break that down for us, because it is it's pretty central to the way you're thinking about what enslaved and free black women are doing in this space throughout the course of your study. 
Absolutely. Uh, so navigation becomes this term that is really helpful for me to understand how they are maneuvering through the different legal contexts mm -hmm. um, that they find themselves in. Um, and and I think this is important because when we have a discussion about Black people in liberty, I think it's easy for there to be sort of a linear trajectory from bondage to freedom. Um, but actually, when you look at the lives of these different women, it doesn't look like that, right? Um, for some women, they um, remain in bondage, right? And so they are navigating the confines of remaining in bondage in DC. For some people, they decide that their avenue to freedom is fugitivity. Um, and then that creates a certain set of conditions um, that make life either very challenging, right? Or even liberating, depending on where they land. Um, so navigation then becomes a, a way for me to frame how these women are maneuvering through the different challenges, but also they're deploying different strategies to respond to those challenges. And what I like about the term, although it's imperfect, it can't be used in every context, right? But what I like about the term is that it helps us understand or pose the question of, okay, if you become legally free, what happens then? Right. Um, is everything amazing? And what we find is actually it isn't right that it's actually quite complicated. And that's when Cedric Robinson's um, racial capitalism framework really helps us begin to understand all the ways in which one's life can be circumscribed by both race and gender. Right. And so um, they are trying to figure out how to realize um, their desires under these really, really tough uh, conditions. Well, that makes a lot of sense. And, and I just want to remind the audience that we'll be coming up on uh, your time to ask questions in just a few moments. So please do get those into the comments. We'd be delighted to feature yours on the screen. And Tamika, I want to come back again to that, that theme of navigation and, and just ask if, for a few examples of how enslaved or free Black women are doing this. You've mentioned a variety of legal contexts and fugitivity and, and whatnot, but mm -hmm. Where do you see uh, this playing out and, and what are some examples of, of women who are doing the kinds of things that you were finding in the records? Absolutely. And so there are women who are appealing to the courts in order to become free. Um, mm -hmm. But oftentimes that doesn't always yield results. Um, and so they're trying to configure different ways to go about it. They might choose to escape instead, right, and pull upon the vigilance networks within the district. Um, there are some people who are um, still enslaved, and we see this um, with Suki Dolly Madison, the um, woman who serves in the household of uh, Dolly Madison, where she um, shows acts of, re there's evidence of acts of refusal, um, but she is never really able to realize some of her aspirations for liberty, but then her daughter does, mm -hmm. right, um, when her daughter escapes with the 77 on the Pearl. Um, there are collective escapes, right? There are people who are um, uh, sort of escaping um, based on a spontaneous moment or reaction. Um, there's one incident where one mother um, is trying to escape with her daughter, and but her daughter is required, and her daughter is a little girl mm -hmm. who is required to sit next to um, the cradle of the owner's child, oh, yeah. and um, and so she has to really sort of masterfully navigate um, how she's going to get her child um, away from this other child, and she manages um, to do that right. But these are the kinds of challenges, right? That people who are assisting them are also thinking about, right? Um, there's this sort of ov overarching idea that um, we really don't want to, you know, we don't really want to have children with us, right? Because that's going to create complications, right? Um, when you're trying to escape, but these women escape anyway with their children, right? Um, and so they're trying to sort of figure out the terrain. But what I think is most important to think about here is that they are leveraging their knowledge, mm -hmm. their knowledge of sort of the social customs Systems, the laws, the geography, the existing networks in order to pursue these, um, these aspirations for self-making. And so it happens in different contexts. Mm -hmm. um, there are some contexts in which it happens through sex work, right? Mm -hmm. And through owning brothels or owning sites of leisure. Um, these kinds of um, pursuits don't always conform to our ideas about moral virtue or respectability, right? Um, but they are really important to these women. The, it's a source of economic um, viability for them. And um, they pursue those avenues, right? And so 
oftentimes these um, don't quite look how we think they're going to look. Um, there are so many different um, challenges that they bump up against um, that they can't really anticipate, but they respond to. And so um, this book is really centered on sort of how they respond, right? And it's very specific to each woman. Well, it strikes me as a very multi-generational story. And then mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if entrepreneurial is the right term, but I mean, I guess within the context and within the confines of of, of what they're uh, up against and what they're confronting, it seems like the, you know they're finding ways, if not outright freedom, at least to uh, make things work to their advantage a little bit in, mm -hmm. in certain circumstances. Yes, absolutely. Um, they are um, they are always trying to figure out ways um, to be autonomous. I think mm -hmm. is really important, right? Because it very much shapes not only how they desire to govern their own lives and the lives of their children if they have them, um, but also how they um, support institutions, African American institutions in particular, like churches and schools and businesses. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're looking for that autonomy in different ways. Um, and so, and some of them are able to really um, leverage. Um, that as well. Alethea Tanner is a really good example of that. Um, Alethea Tanner, she is enslaved and then she has this garden plot and then she begins to produce goods at a marketplace where she is able to then purchase, um, legally purchase her freedom. And then she also secures the freedom of many family members who then become prominent leaders in, um, in DC. But she doesn't stop there. After that, she, you know, becomes one of the major donors for some of the most prominent churches in DC that still exist today. Um, and so this is why um, self-making and thinking about all of these different legal contexts as sort of um, uh, sort of collectively important um, uh, runs, thr runs through the book because um, some women don't remain in that status. And so I think it's important to sort of think about the layers of their lives as much as the archive allows us uh, to see it. Well, you mentioned uh, just a moment ago, I think I heard you say schools and, and communities. Mm -hmm. You know, that got me wondering, because one of the, I think probably one of the more powerful chapters of the book is about school. Mm -hmm and uh, enslaved and, and free black little girls going to school in communities that are sometimes uh, covertly so because of various laws that are taking place. Can you tell us a little bit about these young people and their teachers and the communities that created these schools? And, and you know, how does it help us to understand how people of color are navigating you know, spaces between slavery and, and liberty in the district at this point? Yes, absolutely. And, you know, so the the education literature often really emphasizes a lot of um, the innovations that are being uh, realized in the North. And, and I think that that's right, right? Because many of the traditions, the education traditions that we see in the South are oftentimes modeled, right, on those education, uh, educational institutions in the North. But what was interesting about this story is that um, this was a place that was seen as a Southern place, right? As a place in which slavery, right? Um, and the slave trade was, was um, in existence. And so people who were starting schools in DC saw themselves as doing something really radical and important um, because they were educating um, African-Americans in the district, but they were also um, sort of grooming them to become leaders and to begin to sort of start their own autonomy institutions. And so that is a tradition, right, that starts, you know, in these earlier generations that we're seeing. And um, what's wonderful about these places that I've discovered in my research is how these little girls, I, you know, I often thought that, you know, this was about social reform. This was, you know, about um, respectability in really important ways. Um, but what I saw that was really fascinating is um, just understanding that these little girls were intellectuals. Mm -hmm. um, they loved science. They loved poetry. Um, they loved art. And so they did their own sketches and drawings, as you see here. Um, but not only that, but they were really sort of sort of engaging in a rehearsal of using their political voice. Mm -hmm. and so, um, you know, many of them have predicted very prophetically, right, that the union was going to be torn apart before there could be freedom. Um, and to just have those words written down to me was um, just really so um, fascinating and also very meaningful um, for us to consider. But what's also interesting is um, it's not 
Um, it's not this really romantic situation, right, that we associate with life as a free Black girl, right? You're not enslaved, you're free, so you must be engaged in this very vibrant, free African-American community. And that is true. But what is also true is that these little Black girls, when they are walking to school, people are spitting at them, people are, you know, um, yelling out sexualized and racialized slurs, people are, you um, uh, sort of condemning the existence of these schools. And even the mayor um, of DC argues that, you know, particularly schools for these black girls, right, is actually going to just tear the union apart, right? <laughs> and so, um, so this is, you know, this is, you know, straight from the newspapers, right, straight from the mayor's office, um, that these spaces are really disruptive for white Washingtonians. And I think that's an important point to make because we often sort of assume, right, that white um, residents of DC tolerate uh, free African Americans. They sort of are even sometimes friendly. And yes, there are white allies, um, uh, anti-slavery activists who are working collaboratively with African Americans, but many residents are, are incredibly hostile towards um, these little girls and to black women in general. What was the thinking behind, you know, diatribes like the mayors there where they thought that even, you know, educating a little African American children was going to rip the union apart. Was it a question of of ripping apart the old social order, or was it as you know, sort of moving into the eighteen thirties, forties, and fifties when the, you know the, the so called slave on um, slavery um, and also condemning the slave trade, right? And so the spotlight um, is finally on D.C. right by the eighteen forties and fifties in ways that it had not been before, and a lot of it is um, sort of anxieties around um, these. African Americans and also these white abolitionists being able to mobilize financial resources from white philanthropists in the North to then build the brick and mortar of these institutions, right? And at the same time that he issues this this um, this speech, he's um, uh, Matilla Minor is actually trying to get you know build out the campus of the school, right? And so this becomes um, very threatening. Um, uh, to residents in the city that's, that believe that these little girls in and, um, and these schools are really sort of um, beginning to upend the social order um, of the district. <laughs> well, and, and then thinking about, uh, again, this idea of navigation and, and thinking about the spatial element for a moment. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the things that was really interesting to me is your attention to geography. I mean, right down to, you know, locating buildings on K Street or F Street or any of the number of streets that, that we kind of take for granted today. And I was wondering about how the landscape itself of Washington, mm -hmm. of the district, uh, you know, up through the retrocession of Alexandria in 1846, mm -hmm. beyond, like how, how does the actual physical landscape of that place, you know, shape the contours of slavery and, and shape the ways that enslaved women are moving through this space and, and taking advantage of the opportunities as they can find them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think that um, it's important to kind of name spaces because those streets are still there, right? Um, and and so, you know, I remember I was speaking with, um, with um, someone else about this, you know, when Ann Williams, you know, jumps out of uh, the window of the building um, on F Street, you know, you now see F Street very differently, right, than you saw F Street before. And um, and so I think that these spaces are really important because um, DC is a really important hub for the slave trade, the slave market. Mm -hmm. um, so even how we imagine the National Mall, it would have looked very differently um, in the early 19th century. Um, and even how we envision um, just the architecture and the layout of the city is all really about this sort of national um, aspiration, you know, for something really great and something really symbolic. Um, but at the same time, um, on those same streets that we see today, we see some prominent black institutions and churches that are still standing because of um, the support of Black women. And so I think it's important to sort of really grapple with that and also grapple with the fact that D.C. is very much uh, sort of a part of Maryland and Virginia and a part of the sort of older Chesapeake uh, tradition, even if it doesn't look the same, right? Um, they're drawing upon these Chesapeake traditions in ways that don't fully manifest, um, but do at some times operate in, in very similar ways. Um, and so the location of, of DC also lends itself geographically for more fugitive escapes. Mm -hmm. um, so 
the slavery literature oftentimes highlights the fact that it's much more challenging for enslaved women to escape um, if they're in other parts of the South. But there's something about the geographic location and the proximity to Pennsylvania, and then later also to Canada um, that lends itself, um, and the networks themselves lend themselves to be able to do that, right? And so there's ways in which self-making is um, a possibility because of the geographic um, placement of the district. And that holds true also during the Civil War, where you see refugees coming to um, the district, um, uh, making claims to freedom. And once um, uh, emancipation is legal in 1862, um, DC becomes right, very incredibly significant to them. Well, let's, can we go back to the Ann Williams photograph there, or not photograph, but engraving there for a second, because that is a very dramatic uh, engraving. And, and tell us a little bit about her, as you just mentioned, you know, the knowing where she jumped was important in your story and sort mm -hmm. of that and orienting the reader. So mm -hmm. what, what, what's behind uh, this here? Yeah, so Anne is um, being prepared to be sold um, further south, um, and rather than be sold further south, um, she, you know, she escapes, right? And she escapes in a way that is incredibly um, uh, harmful, right? Uh, to, to her body, she ends up getting pretty hurt. Um, but afterwards, um, she remains enslaved and then is able to actually appeal for her freedom um, through the courts. And she's able to petition successfully um, through the courts. And I think she's a really good example of um, you, you could you can escape slavery one way, right? But actually it ends up happening a different way. And so really just engaging with the layers um, that make up these women's lives and, and how they shift. And, and this is a way that she, you know, this is the way she felt like she could respond. And, and I was torn as to whether or not to include this image because it really is, um, it really is a, a pretty awful uh, image to include. But I think that oftentimes we don't, she captures the kind of desperation that many of these women find themselves in. And I think it was really important to, to include it. No, I, I think it was certainly the right choice because it does drive home the point that there were people willing to you know, take desperate measures to escape an awful situation. Mm -hmm. you, uh, you had said at the beginning of our discussion that uh, you were looking at the Civil War era and realized that there was a whole world of possibility before that. Uh, but mm -hmm. your book does end in the war era. And I'm wondering, mm -hmm. you just mentioned 1862 was a big moment. Mm -hmm. uh, refugees flooding into the capital. What opportunities did enslaved and free Black women have once the war came? And, and how are they able to navigate both the chaos of the war, but also uh, uh, to leverage whatever they had at their disposal? Mm -hmm make something of a better life for themselves in that sort of weird space between slavery and freedom as it was being worked out on the battleground and then also in the, you know, the halls of Congress. Absolutely. Um, you know, in this during the Civil War, there's lots of things happening, right? Um, there's prostitution is happening um, on, a, on a huge scale. And, you know, I argue that it would be um, generically absent for me to not include uh, prostitution, even though we tend to relegate prostitution to sort of a different kind of subfield. But I think it's actually really important to the set of options that are available um, to, to Black women who are free or refugee at this time. Um, but then also during the Civil War, um, they are making appeals directly um, to the Board of Commissioners who are looking at cases right, of uh, people appealing for and petitioning for um, their freedom. They're holding these slaveholders accountable in ways that they hadn't been accountable before, even in the face of having compensation as an option. Um, and then there are um, Freedmen's Bureau records where enslaved women are trying to rescue their children from former slaveholders, right? And so you see just a completely different dynamic there. Um, but the to end in the Civil War also homes in on this point of um, freedom doesn't always look how we think it looks. Um, and freedom is actually incredibly hard. Um, there is overcrowding, there is sickness and disease, right? There is, um, uh, you know, people trying to find families and maybe don't ever find their families. There are people who are trying to be in to find jobs, but don't always find jobs, right? And so, um, it shows just sort of the amount of work that needs to be done in order, you know, for them to kind of realize um, some of their goals. And so even as 
you know, emancipation becomes a reality and that's really important. And it is incredibly important to the people in the book. Um, they're, they're also facing um, a level of desperation um, that I don't think we've really accounted for just yet in, in our discussions of the Civil War. So there must be a, a lot more work to do then, I imagine. I think so, but I think that, you know, scholars are starting to do it. I, I you know, definitely um, the Volia Glimpse, the women's fight is really, yeah. mm -hmm. um, really kind of pushing the boundaries of how we do Civil War history and getting us to think about the complexity of these experiences. And so um, I think that we're beginning to have that conversation in really important ways. Well, I've got one more question for you, and then I, I'd love to open up the floor to our audience here. But speaking of, of more work to do, uh, I believe you have another book coming out here pretty soon, or at least uh, the draft of it's due at the end of the year. And so, you, but you're pretty hard at work. And can you tell us a little bit about that and give us a preview? Yes, absolutely. Um, so I'm working on a book. It's called The Demands of Justice, and it's about enslaved women in Virginia and um, who commit capital crimes um, and the degree to which they're granted executive clemency. And what I'm interested in here is um, what does clemency look like? Um, what does leniency look like and how is justice being defined, um, not only by the um, jurists in early Virginia, but also by the enslaved women themselves? What do their actions tell us about what they're trying to say about justice? Um, and so it's um, organized by the kinds of crimes that they commit. Um, it's a really heavy, it's a heavy book, but I, I do think it's a book that um, um, is relevant in terms of thinking about evolving epistemologies of justice and, and why it's important to look to the past to see how um, enslaved women wrestled with, with this idea. Well, that sounds great. And when it's out, we'll have you back to talk about that one. And speaking of the law, actually, our first question from the audience is Christian. Mm -hmm. We'd like to know, for those who chose to fight for uh, legal freedom, did legal aid societies exist to help them chart that path? Yes, there were definitely um, groups of, of people, particularly um, uh, white allies and also free African-Americans who were willing to assist um, with these freedom suits. There were also um, people who were not necessarily abolitionists, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, were a part of the colonization society, believed that slavery was a big stain on the nation, who were also willing to help represent um, these, um, these people who were appealing for their freedom. Also, William Thomas has a wonderful um, um, new book um, that is also about those those cases as well. And so um, you, you should check that out as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Will's a good guy. That's a, that's a mm -hmm. great presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much, Christian. Great question. Our, our next one's coming from Jean Ann. And it's kind of a similar question about the law. You know, what percentage of, of uh, people were enslaved as opposed to freed in this time period? And then you know, kind of the nuance of the legal status. Was, uh, was it really that much different in terms of, of being enslaved versus free? when there's still the same kind of prejudices they faced on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when the nation's capital was founded, like at the beginning of the 19th century, um, the um, population of enslaved people outnumbered that of the free um, black population. But that changes, um, that changes um, actually quite dramatically. Um, by the um, antebellum decades where you see actually a majority of free African-Americans. So once um, slavery is abolished in DC, um, many of the African-Americans are already freed. Um, and so that, that shifts um, dramatically um, over time. Um, there is a difference um, in what it means to be enslaved and also what it means to be free. It also just depends on the kind of encounter that we're talking about. Um, Alethea Tanner was at one point enslaved and then she um, purchased her freedom and then she became a market woman and she gained a different kind of reputation, right, um, for selling her goods. Um, Elizabeth Keckley, very similarly, right, she was enslaved and, um, and was treated as, a, you know, an enslaved woman and experienced the kind of violence and brutality that is associated with slavery, um, but then becomes you know, one of the most sought out uh, seamstresses in, in the nation's capital. Um, so I think that um, the important thing is to see that all the ways in which their lives might show different layers of perception and encounter um, in these spaces. Well, that's great. Well, thank you, Jean Ann, very much. And we've got a two part question here and uh, from David and, and part one, he's talking about some of the stuff that we talked about earlier in the program uh, with respect to workarounds, but then part two, uh, is looking at the extent to which free Black women uh, also found workarounds to overcome uh, 
legal and social barriers that existed in DC both before and after the end of slavery. Um, mm -hmm. What did you find in your work about uh, those individuals who were free, uh, but I think building off the last question we just talked about a little bit, still faced mm -hmm. kind of the, the, did face those barriers to entry. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think what's important is that they overcame tremendous odds when they did overcome, right? And when they were able to um, mobilize um, both financial, right, um, and social influence. And so um, there were women who were able um, to transcend these kind of legal context, uh, contexts. But um, really, I think what's, what's interesting to me is that these women um, are... Um, are oftentimes creating these autonomous institutions, right? Um, that are really important to um, the people within their community and in, in, in their orbit, right? And so um, they do um, engage into engage in sort of businesses and being able to be um, entrepreneurial. Um, but um, it's also still limited in, in terms of what they can they can do. But many of them are able to do that successfully. Right? And Alethea Tanner. Um, and Keckley are really good examples, but also some other lesser known women who were washerwomen um, who were able to um, earn enough funds to start a school, right? To help their daughters start schools, right? Or to send them to school. Um, so it really just depended um, on the circumstance we're looking at. Well, thank you very much, David. And actually speaking of Elizabeth Keckley, we've got a question coming in. Uh, from our good friend Matt Costello, who is uh, who was wondering if you could talk more about her autobiography and its impact on post Civil War America. Yes, absolutely. Um, well, her autobiography, you know, comes out, you know, and she really is uh, providing not only um, a tell-all memoir of her relationship to the Lincolns, but she's also um, interested in telling her story, and that becomes really um, important um, to folks who are remembering her and thinking about her. I know it was really important to how I discussed her. Um, she is engaged in self-making and, e and even writing um, the autobiography, but I think it's important to note that she actually um, received a lot of um, hostility as a result of her publishing that memoir, um, mainly because of the ways in which she sort of created proximity between herself and the Lincoln household. And right. many people found that in, to be inappropriate, right, and really shunned the memoir as a result of it. Um, but she still maintained, you know, a prominent standing among African Americans in DC. And that to me is also a really important part of her, her legacy. Can you talk a little bit more about that proximity? Because that, that, that raises my curiosity by what, what that relationship was and, and what we meant there. Yes, um, so she was the seamstress, um, uh, the woman who designed many of the beautiful gowns that you saw on Mary Todd Lincoln, um, but she was also uh, making gowns for Verena Davis, uh, Jeff Davis's wife, right? And so um, her in her business, right, yeah. um, she was kind of, you know, transcending those uh, sectional divides, but um, but she really did have a, a very close friendship with uh, Mary Todd Lincoln. And uh, the degree to which she spoke about that created controversy. They thought that she was being too familiar, right? And in that way, it shows us how um, race and gender are still at work, no matter how um, prominent and economically successful you become, there's still this assumption of a black woman's place. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's very much evident in how people responded to the autobiography. Oh, that makes sense. Well, Matt, thanks very much. Good to see you. And our next question is coming in from Lauren, who says, thanks for the excellent talk. And her question is, to what extent, uh, if at all, do antebellum party politics loosen up or further restrict black women's unfreedom or freedom? You know, do the Democrats, do the Whigs, do the Republicans see these issues differently? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, there is a political contest happening that's really important, right, mm -hmm. um, in the decades leading up to um, the Civil War. And um, these women are, are very much um, connected to the networks that are created by anti-slavery activists and also um, those vigilance networks that are helping people, um, particularly fugitives, escape um, the district. But this book is really actually about um, these women and how they imagine their own liberty on um, sort of on, on their own terms, right? And so um, in some ways, um, their aspirations, their imaginings and their desires for liberty don't quite fit um, how Republicans, Whigs, and Dems imagine their place in American society. Um, and so 
the degree to which uh, those politics become really useful and relevant, we see that evident um, in how Black women are talking about politics. But the degree to which they're not, they are imagining new worlds um, that actually include them. Yeah. Well, thank you very, Lauren, Lauren, very much. And Adam is coming in next. He says he looks forward to reading your book. Uh, you should. It's great. Yeah, do you trace the work of these women after slavery ended during the Reconstruction era? I don't. I don't. Um, I don't move into the Reconstruction era. But there's some really wonderful work being done um, uh, by uh, Kate Mazer has written a wonderful book about the Reconstruction era. Robert Harrison has also. Um, and then if you're looking for histories about Black women uh, in D.C., Treva Lindsay has a wonderful book um, as well. So I think uh, I stopped at. Uh, uh, the Civil War, I and mean, kind of generically, but I think it was symbolically important as well. Um, but there's some really robust literature out there that you can consult for the Reconstruction Era. Well, great recommendations, and thank you, Adam, very much. As Susan's coming in. Do we know anything about the enslaved women in Martha Custis's granddaughter's household in Washington, D.C.? Yes, uh, many of them were actually able um, to purchase their freedom and they were able to um, become vibrant uh, members of the African American community in DC. Many of them, their descendants are alive today um, and very much leaders um, and, and in the community. Um, so definitely you can. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great, Susan, thank you. Uh, another question, you mentioned early that African American churches and schools, uh, can you speak more to the uniqueness of these in the DC African American community. Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, so the churches are really fascinating. I had a wonderful conversation earlier with another group about churches. Um, many of the Black codes, right, um, impose restrictions on the mobility of African Americans in the district. So after 10 o'clock, it's illegal for um, for Black people to sort of roam through the streets, right? There's a curfew unless you um, have permission from uh, a slaveholder, a respectable white person, but also um, if you are at church, um, you can be out after um, that curfew. And I think that's a really good way to sort of think about the possibilities of the church um, as both a spiritual space, but also as a very social and political space that becomes really important to the community. It becomes the place in which we see the emergence of African-American leaders. It becomes the space um, of edification. It becomes this the space in which kinship networks are forged. It becomes the space in which they're able to fellowship and break bread um, because normally those kinds of gatherings would be considered unlawful assembly, mm -hmm. right? Any sort of broader groups of African Americans coming together would be would raise suspicion, um, and so these church spaces um, serve um, serve as really transgressive spaces that I think we um, oftentimes we miss that right, and also they were sites where um, vigilance networks. Um, uh, that they used actually to house fugitives as well. So um, the church is actually this really quite radical space um, that should be seen in a very particular early context. I have a quick follow-up actually, because something you just <laughs> triggered, um, something I was curious about, or, or the way that you framed the significance of newspapers uh, in your book as tools of surveillance. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, you know, so I begin the book with this woman named Suki, right? And so these newspaper ads that are um, trying to signal to the community to look out for this person because they're engaged in criminal criminal behavior, right? Um, fugitivity. Um, these those same newspapers help me to understand their what they're doing or what they you know people might imagine that they're doing right and actually give a window um, into even some of their motivations or some of their um, self-making strategies. Um, but these newspapers are used right um, to put people on notice of any kind of threat or. Um, any kind of threat that is posed to the community more more generally, right? And so um, we also see police precinct notices of prostitutes um, getting arrested um, at various points, right? Um, that there are these notorious women out there um, and you better watch out for them, right? And so there are all these different ways in which the newspaper becomes the space that's really important to convey the concerns of the community. It's also in the newspaper that the mayor publishes this speech about concerns about these schools for little black girls, right? And how they pose a threat to the union. Um, so it becomes this really important site of political and social discourse um, that help us sort of see a window into what's happening on the ground. 
Well, we've got two more, uh, two more audience questions. And this next one that's coming in actually feeds very nicely into this discussion mm -hmm. about newspapers because Christy would love to hear about your research process. Yes, how, absolutely. How do you do what you do? Absolutely. I, I first started off at the National Archives um, in the police precinct records and also the court records. Eventually, I um, went to Howard University to the Moreland Spingard collection um, that had some amazing records, um, uh, particularly pertaining to the church um, and uh, to schools. And then I um, was able to scour through newspapers for lots of information about prostitutes. Um, also, police precinct records um, provided a window into that. But some of the earlier um, chapters that are focused on uh, slavery, often often I got those records from prominent uh, sources, right? Like the Dolly Madison papers or, um, you know, records or writings from Margaret Bayard Smith or Thomas Jefferson, right? And so... Um, I went, I went looking wherever there were sort of more questions that I had not addressed. And so it wasn't sort of a seamless organized process. It really was um, pulling upon the help of reviewers, you know, who were um, sort of help guiding me through really tough questions or gaps in my work. And, and I was able to seek out sources um, through that, that way. Well, thanks, Christy. And, and I, to me, because we talked about yesterday when we were prepping for this, I think at some point we are going to talk more about your research process on the podcast. Yes. So I'm mm -hmm. very much looking forward to that. Uh, we've got one more question. And actually, we've got two more questions, but I'm going to package them together because okay. they, they speak to kind of the same theme. You know, Julie's asking, are there any plans uh, for an audio version of the book? And then someone has also asked, how can they get a signed copy of your work? Oh, these are great, great questions that I don't think I've resolved with the press just yet. <laughs> so I'm not sure if there is an audio version of the book. I do know that there's a Kindle um, version, which is not the same, but um, that version is available. Um, in terms of a signed copy, um, I don't quite know how the press will handle this, um, but I am also considering um, getting some book plates um, that I can send out to people who purchase um, the book. So look on Twitter uh, for any announcement of, of that, because I think I'll probably end up doing that. Where, where can they uh, learn more about that on Twitter? Oh, on my Twitter handle, which I think is Tamika Y. Nunley. Oh, very good. <laughs> <laughs> You're impressive. We'll figure it out. Yay. <laughs> love it. Well, Kanika, thank you very much. This has been a terrific conversation. Really appreciated the chance to talk with you about this book and, and thanks for uh, taking the time to come and, and be with us this evening. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Well, it's our pleasure. And, and thanks uh, to all of you out there in the audience. We really appreciate the questions and uh, your attention this evening. And, and thanks for uh, sticking with us for this hour. And, and we're very delighted that uh, you choose to join us uh, on a regular basis. Good to see some old faces and new. Uh, as I promised you uh, at the top of the hour, we, I would uh, mention a few upcoming events for your pleasure. Uh, and so uh, on March the 4th, which is two days from now, uh, join me right back here uh, in my uh, office or living room or whatever this space is uh, for, at 7 p.m. I'll be chatting with the author, Robert Strauss, about his new book, John Marshall, The Final, final Founder. This event is a co-sponsored by the John Marshall House, which is part of Preservation Virginia, and the John Marshall Center for Constitutional History and Civics. So check us out on two days from now on March 4th at 7 p.m. March the 10th, my colleague Joe Stoltz will be talking with historian David Head of the University of Central Florida about his recent book on the Newburgh Conspiracy. And last uh, but not least, be sure to sign up for our Michelle Smith Lecture Series, which will take place over the course of March, April, and May. And that series will explore the founding moment in more detail. And as always, you can find out more about digital talks, past, present, and future, including the replay up tonight in case you have missed it by going to mountvernon.org slash GW Digital Talks. Lastly, I want to thank uh, our good friends, Jeanette Patrick and Sarah Steo, who are working their magic behind the scenes this evening. Uh, your help and your support and your efforts are appreciated as always. Tamika, we did it. Thanks so much. I'm so yeah. glad to be able to do this. Awesome. Thanks, Jim. All right. Well, we'll see you soon. Good night, everyone. Thanks for stopping by.